When it comes to buying watches, maximizing versatility among a lean collection is something that I recommend for many collectors. By following this thesis, it typically comes with looking at watches that can be applicable to pretty much every scenario. But what if you are someone who appreciates classic dress styling, but fears not getting the full use from a dress watch in the casual part of your lifestyle? Well, in this video, we'll look at three great options from Longines, Rado, and Tudor that appropriately fill the role of walking the line and falling in a price range that is both aspirational as well as relatively attainable if you have your sights set. Let's jump in. Now, before we jump into this video, I do wanna mention that if you want more information on the Longines Heritage Classic sector, we have a complete write-up on the entire just collection, looking at the silver versus black dial. What are some things to consider? This is one of my favorite contemporary models from this brand. I'm actually wearing the silver version on my wrist right now. In this video, we're gonna look at the black dial version, but I'd recommend checking out that complete write-up on teddybaldesser.com. It'll be in the description down below. And also, we're an authorized dealer of Rado and Longines. So if you like what you see from either of those two brands here today, Definitely recommend checking them out on our website, teddyballstar.com, full authorized dealer of all the brands that we carry. So for this video, my goal is to look at three leading options for the dress everyday watch category in the price range of around 2000 bucks. These are certainly not the only watches that you can consider in this range, as you could look at the offerings from Oris, Zinn, or even other models from these brands presented here. But I like the heritage connection and the dressy undertones presented by this trio that can serve as a basis for the comparison here. Now to begin, let's start with the least expensive of our trio at $1,800. We have the Golden Horse from Rado, a Swiss brand with a history dating back over 100 years to 1917, having been founded as Schlupp & Co. before transitioning to the Rado name in the 1950s. Dating back to 1957, the Golden Horse was intended to complement the dressier styling that was especially prominent then, but still relevant today. With this current Golden Horse collection that this one is a member of being offered in three different colors with a limited 1,957 pieces for each dial variant. And while the green and the blue dial variants are striking, we decided to take a closer look at the mass appealing black dial one for the purposes of this video. In terms of where the Golden Horse utilizes classic 1950s dimensions with the 37 millimeter diameter, 10.8 millimeters in thickness, and a condensed 44 millimeters with the lug to lug. Overall, the watch wears similar to that of the Rolex Datejust 36 for those familiar with that case, presenting a pleasing compact option for those with leanings to classic case dimensions and in the same way wearing large enough to not look out of place in a contemporary circumstance if you're on the smaller to medium size of the wrist size spectrum. Taking a look at the finishing, the watch is polished across the entire case, a dressier look that works well with the dial and fuses beautifully with the beads of rice bracelet. The lug width is 19 millimeters and it's not the only watch guilty of this on the list here today, but fortunately the bracelet presented is well crafted. It offers a nice comfort, solid finishing for the price and a slim refined clasp. And the end links that shoot straight down from the case further improve its wear. One note is that there are no points of micro adjustment on this push button clasp, so it is less of a certainty to get a perfect fit. But as an owner of a Captain Cook, which shares this bracelet style, I did not have issues in the past, but this could be a concern for some. Set beneath the box sapphire crystal with anti-reflective coating that strongly resembles vintage acrylic crystals, we have an eye-catching dial with a few unique elements. For one, the dial surface is not flat but rather convex, sloping downwards from its center and following the same directional pattern as the crystal offering protection above. In this case, the central surface is matte black and textured with the fine concentric circles that are subtle and only become visible under close examination. Hour markers are applied and polished with the pair of golden seahorses applied at six and an outline date window with a white date disc with red text at three. At noon is the presence of the Rado Anchor logo, as is commonplace for their automatic watches, the anchor actually rotates and will settle at several different designated resting positions. When it comes to time telling, the Golden Horse opts for a set of broader than normal polished Dauphine style hands at center. Flipping the Golden Horse over, we have a screw down case back with an engraved set of seahorses that keep watch over the third party at a C07611 oscillating just underneath. This caliber offers an extended power reserve of 80 hours achieved by reducing the beat frequency of the standard ETA calibers from 28,800 
100 vibrations per hour, 4 hertz, to 21,600 vibrations per hour, or 3 hertz, which helps maximize the reserve of the coiled mainspring. This caliber is another powerful selling point of the Golden Horse offering over the weekend type of reserve, in addition to the peace of mind of using the industry's most established modern movement. In terms of general specifications, you're looking at 21,600 vibrations per hour, 3 hertz. It does feature hacking and hand winding, hacking stop in the second hand when you pull the crown to the farthest position, and a power reserve of 80 hours. Speaking anecdotally to the accuracy of this particular example, the Golden Horse ran between zero to plus five seconds a day, which is a good thing. And that was testing over five different positions. And just to kind of speak to the regulator pin assembly, it is not gonna have a traditional regulator pin setup compared to just off the shelf type of ETA calibers that you might find in the market. Moving up to our next watch priced at $1,950, we have the Tudor 1926 released in 2018 and named for the year that Hans Vilsdorf originally registered the Tudor name. The 1926 aims to capture what Tudor calls the spirit of early watchmaking with a dressier execution and vintage style design format, but not without at least some sport watch utility and a leader in water resistance among this trio with 100 meters. It's also incredibly broad in terms of the collection and variations with a 28, 36, 39, and 41 millimeter variant all made available in a variety of dial colors. However, for the sake of this video, we'll focus on this 41 millimeter variant equipped with an opaline dial and blue markers. On the wrist, the 1926 presents a modern wearing profile with a 41 millimeter diameter, slim height of 9.5 millimeters, and proportional lug to lug for its diameter at 49.2 millimeters. Given the flexibility on sizing with this collection, chances are there will be a size appropriate for nearly every wrist out there, which is a huge benefit to the 1926. Set between 22 millimeter lugs, the 1926 is paired with the most sporty and substantial bracelet of the three watches on test today with a steel fine link execution. The bracelet features screwed in links and tapers to a hidden fold over clasp that operates with excellent action associated with Tudor bracelets with ceramic pins for a snappy and resistant answer to the friction locking and unlocking. Zeroing in on the case finishing, the 1926 case bears resemblance to the Datejust collection from Rolex, albeit a bit thinner, utilizing a rounded polished execution. Worthy of note is that the 1926 features the only screw down crown of the three watches, enabling a capable 100 meters of water resistance that augments this every day watch argument. The straightforward bezel comes with a polished edge for increased pop and guides the eyes to the textured dial surface beneath the sapphire crystal. Of the broad 1926 collection, easily my favorite dial execution is this shade of white silver Tudor calls opaline. This variant is smooth at the minute track, which is printed in blue, with a central waffle texture surface complete with blue applied indices with Arabic numerals at the even hours and small triangles elsewhere. A simple blued leaf style handset handles the time telling duties at the center, and a date cutout at three adds to the utility. In terms of the dial text, only the Tudor word mark at 12 and Tudor signature so called Smiley rotor self winding text is at six to interrupt the eye catching waffle surface. It's a clean and attractive dial design with a bit more interest given the texture compared to many modern Tudor options, though some might say this is boring compared to the other dials featured. Turning the 1926 over, we have yet another closed case back here, safeguarding a straightforward third party caliber in the Salita SW200. While historically aligned with ETA calibers, Tudor has been utilizing more Salita options since the introduction of the Royal in 2020, likely as an answer to the limited availability of ETA calibers to larger brands, especially those outside of the Swatch group, as I am sure Swatch is not keen on providing movements to their leading competitor. Some might be surprised to hear about the use of a Salita caliber in a Tudor watch, but I personally see no issue with it given Salita's rising reputation in the industry in the last decade and serving as probably the best alternative to the ubiquitous 20 2824 from ETA. In terms of the general specifications here, we're looking at 28,800 vibrations per hour, 4 hertz beat rate. Hacking and hand winding are features here, so hacking stop in the second hand when you pull the crown to the farthest position, and a power reserve of 38 hours. Speaking anecdotally to this sample, this particular 1926 kept time at reasonable minus 6 to minus 4 seconds a day when testing across 5 different positions. Wrapping up with our most expensive watch, we have the Longines Heritage Classic Sector, starting at $2,150, but given the bracelet trio we have here, I feel we probably should look at one on a bracelet, and that will come in at $2,350. 
this one coming with a black dial. And while Longines, a brand that dates back to 1832, needs little introduction, the Heritage Classic Sector is a fairly new model family for the brand, having been introduced back in 2019 as a design that pulls directly from Longines' historic archive. Taking a look at the Heritage Classic Sector on the wrist, we have a case dimension of 38.5 millimeters in diameter, 10.9 millimeters in terms of thickness, with some of that height coming from the result of the box section sapphire crystal. And lug to lug is a tad longer for the diameter at 47 millimeters, but wears well thanks to the sharp sharply downswept lugs and position of the spring bar holes within seated higher than normal. Despite what is a dressier execution, the sector leans into fine linear brushing on the entire case with the only hits of polishing taking place on the three o'clock push pull crown and the case back. As a note, this model is only rated for 30 meters of water resistance, making it the least capable watch on the list in terms of aquatic capabilities, yet in turn is probably the most refined in its presentation. Set between 19 millimeter lugs, the sector leans into a well-executed beads of rice style bracelet with small individual links held together by push pins and a signed milled clasp with several points of micro adjustment, which completes a phenomenal bracelet in terms of aesthetics as well as comfort. Beneath the crystal, which is treated with effective anti-reflective coating on its underside, we have what is perhaps the cleanest, most understated dial of the three watches, following a basic sector design format established by Longines on the first half of the 20th century. Of the many brands making sector dials in the 1930s and 40s, Longines was among some of the best, and that standard continues here with this design. By balancing a range of textures, including a fine circular grain near the simply printed minute track with a more matte granular execution in the dial center that also features a printed crosshair, the Heritage Classic Sector presents a powerful lesson in the art of symmetry. Dial text in graphical elements are carried out with thickly applied contrasted printing paired with simple steel stick hands that are perhaps the least legible of the three watches, but still do the job for my younger eyes at least. There is no date function to speak of, and only the neatly integrated small seconds register breaks up the minimalist design format. Turning the sector over, we have a polished engraved case back, and underneath we have the impressive Eta Caliber produced in collaboration with Longines, the L893.5, a heavily modified caliber based on the Eta 2895. Both Longines and Eta are wholly owned by the Swatch Group, a relationship that has produced a series of special calibers only used by Longines, meaning these movements aren't technically in-house, but they are a bit more special than your average Bosch caliber. The L893.5 operates at a seldom seen 3.5 Hertz or 25,200 vibrations per hour with an extended power reserve of 72 hours and also features a silicon balance spring to help resist against magnetism. With this watch's higher price point, it is nice to see the additional attention paid to the movement, which also keeps excellent time, running at plus three seconds a day when testing on a full wind at five different positions despite not being a certified chronometer, I think this is pretty impressive. In terms of general specifications, it's going to operate at 25,200 vibrations per hour, 3.5 hertz, does feature hacking and hand winding, and a power reserve of 72 hours. So now that we've gone through an overview of these pieces, let's just kind of talk about the pros and cons affiliated with all of these watches, and which one might be the better one to go for for you. Starting with the Rado Golden Horse, I think one of the big upsides is going to be, this is probably the most 50s, 60s in its feel. So it has its own distinct look. Also is going to feature a wearing experience that's going to be the most in alignment with uh, those vintage type of dimensions. Solid movement on the inside with that extended power reserve and pretty solid finishing for the price. When it comes to some cons or maybe some things to consider, the 19 millimeter lug width is going to be a pain for some. Also getting no micro adjustment in that clasp, which I think could be a deal breaker for some people out there. If you really do like this Beezer Rice bracelet, there are of course other third party options, but I just think this looks so good on this configuration. And also I would say it's the least dressy of the three. You're not really getting the upside of a sports piece. It has a middle kind of the road water resistance, uh, but it kind of looks a bit more sporty in some aspects and just doesn't have those dressy undertones as much as maybe the other two will have. So that could be something going against it. Now looking at the 1926 from Tudor, I think one of the biggest upsides is this is kind of that entry door to get into Tudor. It's legitimately one of the most inexpensive Tudor watches you're going to find. Also getting an excellent bracelet in the process here. I would say it's the most substantially built of the three. I don't know if it's my favorite, but you could definitely tell it's a well-crafted bracelet. Certainly get points there. And I like how they integrated the fold over locking clasp to just be more elegant uh, while still incorporating the traditional uh, ceramic pins that are in that clasp. So you kind of get the sports upside with kind of some more elegance and refinement uh, in its execution. 
It's also gonna be a pretty dressy configuration for Tudor standards. If you look at something like the Black Bay 36 is another one to look at. I think this offers a lot more dressy undertones than that. 100 meters of water resistance, so you still are getting some sporty upside here. And also that case optionality. You have basically a full list of different case sizes you can choose from. So you're pretty sure you can probably say you're gonna have one that's right for you. Now for just some cons and things to consider. The third party caliber, you're not getting any benefits of an extended power reserve. And when comparing it to something like a Rado and a Longines, you're gonna fall behind. You're looking at double the performance uh, when it comes to a power reserve from those brands based on what you're getting with this Tudor. So that is certainly something to consider. Also speaking to this model and where it sits within Tudor's overall just lineup, it really does get overshadowed by the Black Bay in many instances. So this is not really the most popular model and you're kind of going for it just because it's maybe the more attainable option or you just like the looks of it more than the Black Bay, which is gonna have more of a tool oriented approach and heritage approach. And then also I think some could argue in kind of that same type of note, this one just kind of lacks a little bit of character compared to maybe some other designs out there. It kind of just feels like a very safe design in many ways, which might be exactly what you're looking for if you're trying to maximize versatility. But on the flip side, if you want something with character and is really different, I wouldn't say this is one of the leading watches in that regard. Now looking at the Heritage Classic sector, some pros and cons. For one, I think this is one of the most tasteful Heritage models. I think the design is just absolutely amazing. Love the look of this watch. Sizing is good. It's kind of that middle of the road. I can see this working on a wide variety of wrists. It's broad enough where it's not gonna size everybody out and also keep some people included that are on the larger end of the spectrum for wrist size. So it's really in a nice sweet spot. Also the caliber and power reserve, you're getting that upgraded uh, silicium hairspring with this particular variation and also getting a more unconventional beat frequency, which although maybe not fully utilized and realized with the look with the sub seconds, it is nice to see a cleaner sweep with that 3.5 Hertz presented here. This is also a clean and symmetrical type of design. For those that are all about no dates, this is it done at the finest degree. Also the bracelet is simply fantastic. Probably my favorite of the trio. This watch just has a completely different feel. And this is a watch that over the past two years, I've said it's my favorite, uh, one of my top 10 favorite releases back to back years. One with the silver dial in 2020, and then in 2021, I mentioned the black dial. This version here is one of my favorites. So really kind of speaks to, I think, what this watch presents and what I like about it. Also, it's probably the most refined of the three options. It doesn't have the same sporty undertones, really any sporty undertones. It doesn't feel so overly elegant where it couldn't be a use in a modern context, but it has kind of that understated nature of the set dial that just works in dressier scenarios without having to really reach too far in that end. Now for some cons, I think the 19 millimeter lug width is difficult to hear. With the bracelet, I think this does minimize that as a huge downside. Also gonna be the most expensive of the trio here. And then the limited case options is also going to be something to consider. Unlike some of the other models like the 1926, uh, you are getting some variations between the cases. And then finally, water resistance. This is going to be the weakest of the trio and probably the number one downside of this watch. 30 meters, it would have been great to see 50 meters or maybe even 100 meters, but I think this watch kind of knows what it's trying to be. So I'm not gonna be so hard on it here, but if you're somebody looking to buy and water resistance is important to you, you're trying to have more of an everyday style watch, not as much kind of this elegant understated nature and this could be a big point to consider but i'm a big fan of all of these watches if i had to pick for myself which is my favorite i think i would go for the long jean heritage classic sector i am wearing one right now i think the reason really being is it's unlike the other two i think a definitive choice for the style of watch that it's representing i can't think of a better sector dial for around two thousand dollars and you also get the great archive great finishing movement solid I just think it comes together for a really nice package. But I think these are all great choices depending on your circumstance. It would really kind of factor in these pros and cons when looking in their direction. And also just look at other brands out there. You could look at the likes of Oris. You can look at Tudor even further, looking at the Black Bay and some other Longines models. Also look at Zinn with the 556 and the 856 as some other great options in this price range. But all right guys, that is my comparison of these three watches. If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe and hit the bell icon, really would appreciate that. Also be sure to check out teddyballister.com, full authorized dealer of over 30 brands, quick and fast fulfillment, dedicated customer support, and a full factory warranty for all the products that we offer. Also, in addition to that, definitely check out the Instagram where you can see some great photos of watches and stay up to date with the content as well. But guys, thank you again so much for watching. Be well, and I will see you all very soon.